Hi everyone, Dr. Samantha Cotrera here for the Imagining a New We video series, a video series designed to help history teachers and other history educators teach history in ways that are more meaningful, transformative, and inclusive for their students. Because Mondays are meaningful, I wanted to start the video series for the fall every Monday with um, just like a short reflective piece on um, some different theories or ideas that you might want to incorporate into your practice. Um, I'll post them early on Mondays. I probably won't even be awake. I'll just schedule the the um, uh, the postings. I'll post them early on Mondays. So if you want to uh, to watch them over a cup of coffee or to listen to them over a commute, um, you can certainly do that. Um, the idea is just to connect a little bit more with some bigger theories, which was actually the idea of the video series in January. And with COVID, it kind of changed to discussing and having conversations with people, which is amazing. But I wanted to bring back in some ideas with theory to, to kind of help us kind of ground our exploration of practice into, into new ways, right? Like we can talk about a lot of different things, but it is also nice to reflect upon things that theorists and activists have said. So that's what the Mondays Are Meaningful series is about. Um, and as I was like thinking of different quotes and different theories that I could bring into this series, I realized I did a lot of that work uh, for my book, like for, <laughs> for the, the work that I do uh, as a writer and a theorist myself. So my book, Transforming the Canadian History Classroom, Imagining a New We, will be out in September, uh, early October. This is still a fake copy, but I'm so excited for it to come out. Um, and I just thought rather than start kind of fresh, I'm going to pull quotes from there. Not my own quotes, but um, quotes from theorists that I have found really inspirational or thoughtful that I have incorporated into the book. So if you wanted to learn more about it or read more about it, you can use my book as well as go to the original source themselves. Now, it is a stressful start of the school year, um, which is the most redundant uh, statement of the year. And in through all of August, I took a little bit of a break from being active on Twitter, um, but I kind of hovered around some of the conversations. And, you know, I don't even know how to suggest that we start teaching and learning this year because we're all coming into such different environments than we know, but also um, different environments from each other, right? So even if you're on the same school board, two schools might have a completely different experience, two classes might have a completely different experience, two teachers in the same grade in the same class might have a different experience because of what their own home lives are. So. I didn't, you know, I've been really thinking about like, how do you, how do you, like, what's a way to start in thinking about this work that's kind of, you know, big and, uh, and encapsulating of what we're going through. And I couldn't think of anything. And I also just thought that's not useful because everyone is coming at it from such different places that it's not useful to have some sort of like big overarching, like, this is how we get through together. So instead, what I was thinking of was like, the theories that guide my own practice and the theories that that I often think of when I am in teaching and learning situations from a range of different ages, from K all the way up to higher education and professional development. And I was thinking of Bell Hooks's work on engaged pedagogy and about uh, education for democracy and love. And maybe that will come closer to the election when we, the American election, and we're all super stressed. But what I kind of landed on for today's video is two different ideas that I, I, I like to think are at the core of my teaching and learning practice. And that is the concept of unconditional education. And the other one is the concept of invitational education. And these two things for me work hand in hand. And I want to bring these up today in this short video because I think that at the very least, perhaps this can be a way to help us think about how we're going to navigate a situation that's going to be incredibly stressful for teachers and students. So unconditional education, which comes from a 2005 article by Cohn, um, he writes that like as educators we need to ensure our education is unconditional. That if a student is misbehaving in a class on Monday, that when they come into class on Tuesday, we smile, we say hello, and we are there to support their education. That we are there unconditionally 
This is an unconditional space to learn from, that students will know what to expect when they come to our classes, be that virtual or in person, and that they will know that there are always invitations to learn. And I'll get to that invitation part in a second. But I'm gonna just use an example for this unconditional education. And to be honest, when I was first introduced to it, by an uh, educator by the name of Barry Bennett, who used to work at OISE, and whose work is really the foundation of so much of my pedagogical work. When I was first introduced to it, I was like, well, why do my students are like disrespecting me? Like, I need to, I need to ensure that they know the next day that they can't do that. And of course, but they, I, I can still uh, treat the learning space as unconditional. So uh, an example, from not too long ago, I was teaching a class, it was a college class, and there was a student that I suspected may have been very liberal in borrowing from other sources to write her own work. Um, and I emailed the student and I had said, can you send me your notes for this? And the student was like really, really defensive right off the bat and just like shot back these emails. What are you doing? What are you asking for? Blah, blah, blah. And I just felt like, I mean, the response in and of itself, but the reaction was really, really rude. And I was like really upset. I had to go for a walk, I had to calm down. Um, and then when I saw the student the next time, when we had a one-on-one -on -one meeting, like big smile, big hello, let's start learning. And while I did send an email to that student saying this isn't an appropriate way to communicate with me, the when we were in class time, when we were doing our one-on-one uh, -on -one teaching and learning, it was always an unconditional space to learn. When that student apologized for overreacting on something, when they were working with me on learning what plagiarism actually is, we were always coming to a space that we were going to teach and learn together. And it wasn't a space where I was going to reprimand the student. Like the student knew what to expect when they came to me. Consistent, clear outlines for proper academic work, but also consistent, clear space for teaching and learning. And I felt like it was really successful because with that situation, the student and students in the past would just like, you know, not come back to class, not engage anymore, get really angry. And I too could think of my own reaction to be like, well, that student was rude to me on an email on a Sunday night. When I see them on Monday, I'm gonna be rude to them back. And like, what does that achieve? Like, sure, it can, it can like demonstrate my power in the class, but what it also does is to let the student feel consistently like they're not welcome or that they're not part of a learning community because they may have misbehaved. And while I'm talking about 21-year-old students, I'm also thinking about 7-year-old students and 8-year-old students and 15-year-old students. And I had read this like tweet, I'm sorry I'm not citing it correctly, <laughs> about someone that said, you know, every time this summer when my 8-year-old misbehaved, I just remembered that there was a day, a day in March where I picked him up from school and he didn't see his school or his friends again for months. And so students are going to be working through their own stuff, especially if you have a different um, schedule to the day. And they're going to be bringing in a lot of baggage. And you're coming into class with a lot of baggage too, right? Like you're a human as well. I get it. And so being unconditional, like this is the space for teaching and learning. We all can have bad days. I can have a bad day. You can have a bad day. But at the end of the day, like we're all humans together in this space. We're here to teach and learn. Some days will be easier than others, but like this is the space that we should know what we're going to expect. And so that's why I love this notion of, in, of unconditional education. But I pair it with this notion of invitational education that was um, discussed by Perky and Novak in 1998. And I love, I love, I love this notion of invitational education. And if you've read any of my work, if you have watched any of the videos, you know I use the word invite a lot, and it really comes from this notion of inv invitational education. That everything that we do, that we say, that we do with our bodies, that our classrooms look like, that our halls look like, that our school structures look like, should all be an invitation for students to learn. To say, you are welcome here to learn. And when I have found, and I wrote this in the book, when it's a skateboard. <laughs> I don't know if you can hear that going by. 
um, I wrote this in the book that I found when students are being resistant, when they're not when they're not getting it, when they're not doing it, when they're being rude, they are not taking the invitations I'm offering. Like they're not saying, oh, that that's a party I want to go to, for example. They are saying, no, oh, this is not right for me. This is this is not something I want to engage in. And so as an educator, I understand my work is constantly understanding the dynamics of the people in the room, in the space, to be able to think about how can I invite these people, these young people, to learn with me, uh, to learn from me, uh, to teach me a variety of different things. And so these invitations are through my comportment, through smiling, making eye contact, learning people's names, but it's also about ensuring there's culturally responsive curriculum. Um, it's ensuring that if students come in that look like they want to be defiant, like maybe that's an important element of who they are becoming um, to like figure out how to work with that. You know, I worked with a lot of youth that would come in with their baseball caps and their headphones and okay, I'm not going to force you to do that. I would just like tap one ear to identify they need to take one earbud out to hear me. But like, hey, the invitation is here. I'm not going to force you to do anything you want. You do it when you, you do it when you're ready. And a lot of times, like after a while, students would come in and they would take their headphones off right away because I demonstrated that it's an unconditional environment. Uh, it's a series of invitations and they are comfortable enough with me to, because I'm consistent, right? Because it's an unconditional learning environment to take those opportunities. Now I say this, it doesn't always work. Those invitations might work really well in your class and the things that you say and the things that you do, but the students will go out in the hall or down to the cafeteria and they will receive invitations that they don't want to take. Like it might not be a, um, you know, a constructive um, schooling environment, um, which we all know, like the environment of schooling can be um, really uh, unmeaningful for both teachers and students. And they also just might feel like they're in a world right now that is very uninvitational to them. And um, we have to be aware and responsive to that. And that's why it's important that our classrooms are as consistent as possible. Again, you know, you can see I'm a smiley woman. I try to bring that into teaching and learning situations that, that I am in. Doesn't mean that you have to smile all the time. It just means that means that you're authentic and you're consistent and that you're open to what students are putting out there. So you can provide invitations that make sense to them, that are meaningful to them. And when you get that chance of meaningfulness in your interactions with teachers and with your interactions with students, then you can co-create um, space that's more transformative for your students and ultimately create content and learning uh, and assessment strategies that are more inclusive as well. So anyway, because Mondays are meaningful, that's what I want to start today's Monday off with. Um, I hope that your transition back to school has, I don't know, just like not fucking sucked. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, I should have said I was gonna swear, but there's just like a lot of swearing like in, in your soul right now, it's so stressful. I just hope that all the anxieties that you've had about the beginning of school, either those anxieties have resulted in some productive solutions to situations in your classroom or that they weren't as bad um, or that you're just able to ride them out. Um, it's going to be a difficult fall and uh, the more that we can discuss together, the more that we can uh, understand this difficult work together and process it together and not just, and this is something I talked about in the book as well and I actually didn't mean to mention it today but I'm going to do it anyway. The more that we have a chance to vent and reflect on, or excuse me, the, the more that we have a chance to reflect on the processes that we're going through and venting is part of that, like that's really important. But the reflection to make change is such a key, key element of it, the stronger we're going to be. The problem, though, sometimes is that venting can go to complaining or what one teacher called bitching, where we just don't see any way out. There's just no solutions. And so we need to take our venting, which again is healthy and important in our difficult, stressful work, and move it towards reflection, which is allowing us to think about how this difficult situation can be better. 
So anyway, I'll talk maybe more about that in the coming weeks. Um, have a really great week, everyone. And I hope you like the other videos for the uh, Pandemic Pedagogy and Source Saturdays videos that are going to come this week uh, and weeks to come. All right. Have a great week.